Uh, and next up, we're going to come back to Chennai, guys, also with someone else from education. I'm going to say hi to Vedika Agarwal as she shares her excerpt from the book. Hi, Vedika. Hi. Thank you for this opportunity, Antra. I understood their concerns as I had been pondering over these contextual nuances myself. I could only imagine their pain and empathize with them. While I sat lost in thought, guilt, and helplessness amid the chaos, screams, and sobs, I suddenly remembered my conversation with Tanya, which made me think of everyone else I could potentially approach for help. In no time, I had a whole network in mind whom I believed I could mobilize to support these well-deserving women and their families. On my way back home that evening, I felt enthused, positive, angry, and disappointed all at once. I was happy to have witnessed essential community-based women-centric leadership, of course, but I was upset that the global unit created to protect the world's population had somehow overlooked nearly 600 million of its residents who were bound to face similar contextual challenges all over the world. Social distancing, regular sanitation, self-quarantine, work from home, and many other such recommendations have been designed for those who can only indulge in these measures. Not everyone can, however. With cramped home environments, limited food and water resources, strapped capacities for savings, and reliance on daily wages, millions of people are forced to face two pandemics simultaneously at the mercy of civil society and governments. Which begs the question, whose world is the World Health Organization here to safeguard? Mine, theirs, or ours? Thank you. Thank you so much, Vedika. We appreciate you taking the time to join us today. I'm going to have Vedika weigh in on this as well. Vedika, you also deal with a lot of uh, students who are underprivileged, and I know that you're somebody who feels very deeply and you're super connected with all of your students. So, uh, Vedika, what has it been like for you going through this time and maybe not having that connection with all of your students that you're used to? And like Maya was saying, not everybody can afford a laptop or afford to be educated online. So I'm curious about your thoughts on this. Yeah, I completely agree with uh, Maya's point of view that this form of blended learning is going to work only for the families who can afford technology and bandwidth. Um, which a large percentage of underprivileged children and their families cannot. Um, so we do have to keep them in mind and consider their realities when we are charting the way forward for what education is going to look like. And not just technology. Um, so many of my children personally come from extremely abusive domestic households. Um, and school is actually their only safe sphere. So if you're going to take that away from these children, where are they going to go? And how are they going to break out of systemic abuse? And how are they going to be able to be exposed to uh, different mindsets and different opportunities? Um, so it's not only about technology at that um, income level. It's definitely way more nuanced. There is so much that needs to be considered um, that I feel like a lot of conversation is not being centered around because technology is the most apparent um, uh, gap that needs to be filled and that is being filled. But like I mentioned, there is so much more, like for even, uh, for example, the midday meals, a lot of children go to school simply to have access to that food supply, um, which has been cut off now. So um, blended learning, not sure how that's gonna work in lower income societies, um, but of course it is going to be uh, an opportunity for governments to explore um, next steps in education. So Vedika, I think one of the emotions alongside fear that I can feel today is also guilt a little bit. I think mothers are feeling guilty, educators are feeling guilty. I can see that you really feel a, a sense of guilt, I think, at not being able to do all these things for the students that you love so much. But do you feel like at least talking about it, uh, sort of highlighting it in the book will get its you know, a little bit of that importance that this topic deserves? Absolutely. Um, I'm guilty not only because I feel handicapped, for lack of a better word, but also because of 
the background I come from and the background of the children that um, I work with, it is so starkingly different. And I have to deal with that reality um, every single day of my life. Um, so while I do see some of my children on Zoom every day, I am doing it from the privilege of my private room with my air conditioning on, on my comfortable bed. Whereas my child across the screen is sitting in an extremely small home with the background noise of their family and, um, you know, things like that. So the guilt definitely stems from there as well. Um, and yeah, giving voice to these contextual nuances is important, but um, I feel like every time individuals such as myself try to voice it, what we hear back in return is that, oh, it's a systemic issue, um, you know, and how are we going to fix a systemic issue? Um, especially in light of an ongoing pandemic, like systemic issues are being fixed in relation to the pandemic. But what's being forgotten is that education is what breaks these children out of the traps of poverty. So it is also a systemic issue that needs to be highlighted in terms of the pandemic. Well, I think Vedika, you've uh, actually given us a lot to think about. So